The Oklahoma Sooners are on the verge of landing a transfer wide receiver, an offensive lineman. Who could it be? We'll talk about it on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. And shout out to every member of the Everyday Club. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. My buddy here is Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at JoshOnRef. You can also hear him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on 94.7 The Ref and Norman. And Josh, it is commitment season all of a sudden for the Oklahoma Sooners. It seemed like a, a dry stretch. Then we got... Jeremiah Newcomb back in March. Michael Hawkins just a couple weeks ago. We got the the news of now I'm blanking on his name all of a sudden. KJ Daniels just the other night. And then now we're getting crystal ball predictions one after another after another uh, for an offensive lineman that we'll talk about here in a second. But the first one, let's talk about Texas transfer wide receiver Brennan Thompson. Uh, The wide receiver out of Texas, the 2022 uh, signee played as a true freshman for the Longhorns last year. Only caught one pass. It was a big play, 30 yards, something like that. But an intriguing option for the Sooners to add to a wide receiver depth chart that's pretty busy. They, they got a lot of names down there that they don't really have an answer or roles for everybody. And you're bringing another guy into the mix that I don't know. He, the The talent, the ability definitely intrigues me. It's something that we're not sure that they have on the roster right now. Yeah, and and we know that they need wide receiver help, and you'll take an opportunity to bring in wide receiver help however you can get it. This, uh, from a production standpoint, doesn't necessarily, John, fit the portfolio that I was talking about the other night where you say, okay, if there's somebody out there, and again, I, I get it. These folks, there's not a lot of singers out there in the transfer portal. And oh, by the way, Oklahoma didn't didn't win that recruiting battle. So the idea that you're going to go out and find a ton of wide receivers or really any position where there's just this wealth of experience and talent and oh, by the way, it's a all-conference type performer. I, I understand those situations are not, not a ton of those. Those are few in far between in the transfer portal. But to me, that's the kind of guy – you were hoping somehow that situation presented itself. But, hey, Brennan Thompson, somebody that uh, obviously is, uh, you know, was a four-star kid coming out of high school, 5'10", uh, 165 coming out, top 150 recruit. And uh, if, if that comes available to you, then then sure, you welcome it, just based on kind of what Oklahoma's uh, situation looks like in terms of uh, wide receiver. So I don't know that this was the exact name, that a bunch of Oklahoma fans had kind of uh, earmarked on the board. And really, though, Oklahoma had offered John, Oklahoma in his initial recruitment wasn't really, you know, wasn't one of the main players. Now, maybe it's just the Emmett Jones factor at work here for Oklahoma. But uh, to me, this is sort of a a name that it, I don't know, feels like kind of came out of left field. Yeah, it, it did a little bit. I mean, you look at, you know, the, the teams that were in kind of his final five and, you know, you're looking at Texas, Alabama, Texas A&M, uh, I believe Oregon, you know, th- these were the, the schools that he was most heavily uh, pursuing or interested in. Uh, but, you know, the Emma Jones thing that matters, like this is a, a wide receiver coach that has a lot of uh, recruiting cachet, you could say, um, and, and a proven developer. And what's interesting to me is you just kind of read some of the background on him. You, you see what the national scouting analyst, you know, Gabe Brooks over at 247 Sports had to say about him. And he he reminds me of kind of a Percy Harvin type, a guy that in high school was used in a lot of different ways, you know, took handoffs out of the backfield, took a lot of reverses, played traditional wide receiver, just did a little bit of everything because his speed is so dynamic that you just got to get the ball in his hands any way that you can. I mean, he ran uh, in track. He ran the 100-meter dash. And he ran a 10.38 as a junior in the 100 meter dash. So, like, 
again, we talk about legit track speed that's game changing, and that's what he brings to the table. Something you're not necessarily sure that you have. You know, you don't have the guy that's that's going to be a threat on the field no matter what he does because when his speed's out there, teams have to take account. They got to make account. They got to be accountable to it because you lose him for a second and he's gone. And you know, Dylan Gabriel may not have the strongest arm, but he's got enough arm. And you know, we're not going to see teams kind of take him out of the game. But if they do have to, um, you know, account another safety to him or deploy another safety to be aware of him as a deep threat, that just opens things up for everybody else underneath a Jalil Farouk an Austin Stogner, a Drake Stoops. Will he start? Probably, maybe, maybe not. We'll see how things transpire in the fall. But again, it's just another weapon that you have at your disposal that you can get the ball to in a lot of situations. I mean, we saw them put Gavin Freeman in those situations where you could get him, give him the ball on reverse. You throw a go route to him. Now you're going to got. Now you have a guy that's got even better speed than Gavin Freeman does. So very intriguing possibility here. If the Sooners are in fact going to land him, Parker Thune puts in the crystal ball. Uh, it seems like Oklahoma is kind of the trending favorite. Um, the, the, the whispers have been there for some time. Now it seems like there's actually some like validity to those whispers. Well, and Jeff Levy kind of had the uh, kind of had a type, right? Kind of had a wide receiver, big body, six, uh, three and up type wide receiver is the, the offers and commitments we saw from day one, as soon as Jeff Levy took the job. Well, that's great. And Oklahoma's got several of those big bodied wide receivers that you need, John. But now all of a sudden the, the last two ads in the wide receiver room, since image Jones took over, what do they both have in common and KJ Daniels and right here with Brendan Thompson? Yeah, they can, they can get up and go. Right. So you've paired the big body wide receiver with somebody that again, as you mentioned, John 10, three, 100 meter guy, the track speed, that uh, Thompson has here. So I'm all about it, man. You got to have all of those different types in your wide receiver room to really, uh, you know, get the most out of what Jeff Levy wants to do offensively. It's not difficult again, just like I said, with KJ Daniels, with Brendan Thompson, it's pretty easy for your mind to go to that place where Thompson's an end around jet sweep guy, right? You line him up in the backfield every now and again, then all of a sudden you take him from the backfield and split him out wide into the slot or, just out wide altogether. So you can do a lot of different things with somebody like Thompson that has that 10, three type track speed. And then again, it, it, it just creates so much space for everybody else because when that jet sweeps coming around and you got a guy with that kind of speed and Dylan Gabriel, he keeps it on a play on an RPO or something like that, or he fakes the handoff. It just makes everybody flow that direction. And then he can either hand it off, go in the other direction, or he can pick it up, pop it, and go downfield with it You know when the safety's been drawn away from whoever's on the opposite side of the field. So just a really intriguing option. The other thing we want to touch on before we turn the page here, Isaiah Autry, the offensive lineman that is trending heavily toward the Oklahoma Sooners now with several crystal balls from Oklahoma insiders, uh, Mississippi State, Ole Miss insiders, all across the board now is going to commit on Friday, April 21st, 1 p.m. Central Time. So we'll have that covered uh, as it happens as well uh, here on Locked On Sooners. But, you know, we I, I kind of mentioned that Oklahoma was going to be getting a commitment this weekend. This wasn't the one I had in mind. But when Josh asked me over under one and a half on the live show the other night and I took the over, well, here, here it is. We're in commitment season for the Oklahoma Sooners. We got, you know, the, the three already on board. It's looking really, 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 really likely that Isaiah Autry is going to commit to the Sooners on Friday. And then I, there's a strong, strong possibility. I believe there's going to be one more commitment over the weekend as well. So it's going to be a big time weekend for the Sooners at the spring game as well. But coming up next, Josh, we've got ESPN's football power index projecting the Big 12 and Oklahoma's win losses for the 2023 season. First, let me talk to you all about built Bar built bar, the best tasting protein bar. If you've ever ha never had it, you got to try it. Tastes great, it's great for you. Great macros, low carb, low calorie, low sugar, high in protein 17 grams of protein, four or five grams of sugar, depending on which bar you get, and so many great flavors. I love the peanut butter brownie, the coconut almond, the mint brownie as well. 
Again, fantastic flavors and great for you. And they've got something exciting coming to Built.com on April 22nd. We haven't gotten the details yet, but we are itching to see what they've got cooking in store for you. Go to Built.com on Saturday, April 22nd. If you're on your way to the spring game, just type it in, Built.com on your phone. If you're sitting at home watching on ESPN+, Plus, just type it in on your computer, Built.com, and see what Built is going to have for you. And you can figure it out. You can find it out. And you can get 15% off this new flavor. I'm hoping it's going to be something like a, a crunchy peanut butter you know, brownie, something like that, because I love crunchy peanut butter. Give me a little nuts in there, a little texture on a, on a Built Bar. It's going to be good stuff. Go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKS15. Get 15% off your order over at Built.com. So, Josh, we got ESPN Football Power Index projections for the 2023 season. Uh, just if you haven't, have you seen the projections? Did you look at them today? Uh, I know Oklahoma is what 11th nationally. Yes. So do you want to guess what their win total projection was? Uh, I mean, the win the win total projections are so weird on this deal. It's like, I'm, I'm going to say it like doesn't add up, but I'll say like 8.5, uh, 4.5, 9.7 and 2.8. So right there on the, the precipice of a potential 10 win season uh, second in the conference, just behind Texas, Texas, a top you know, number five team in the nation in the ESPN FPI, the football power index. And again, these, these are projections um, based on several diff- different factors over at ESPN um, that they include. Uh, they run through 20,000 simulations uh, using strength of schedule, remaining schedule results to date ratings, um, that they just kind of compare things. And then it's a, a, a re, sorry, it represents how many points above or below average a team uh, is based on the projections. So uh, Oklahoma coming in a second, I think it's respectable. Uh, now it's prove it time. It's show us that you're going to be that good. Uh, but given all the turnover, it, it's not unreasonable or, and given the schedule, it's not unreasonable for this team to be a nine win team flirting with 10 wins this season. I think, to me, anything less than eight would be disappointing. Um, and anything nine or better to me would be gravy. You know, I, I expect them to be contending for the Big 12 title uh, game uh, in November. You got to get to November before you can really compete. But I expect them going into November to be just kind of right there with Texas, with, you know, maybe Kansas State, uh, maybe Texas Tech. Just uh, those teams that are going to be at the top of the conference, the top of the standings, just fighting it out to see who's going to be representing in the Big 12 championship game in Arlington. 2.1% chance to go undefeated. I, this is what I love. 9.7 projected wins, 2.8 projected losses, which of course adds up to an even 12 and a half games. So I, I don't know if that's them trying to account for the Big 12 championship game potentially i just i need somebody to give me the the full full explanation for how the projected win loss comes together everything else makes sense but 2.1 percent win out chance uh basically it's uh according to the espn fbi john it's knock on wood here it's a guarantee that you're getting at least six wins according to what they're looking at. They've got it basically at a hundred percent, 99.7% there. And uh, about a one in four chance that you're winning the big 12. So you agree one out of four chance to win the conference and they've got it essentially one out of 10 to make the college football playoff. I would say, I mean, to me, just given the schedule being what it is, John, if you told me right now, Oklahoma wins the big 12 championship, I would say they're going to the college football playoff because I don't know that they're winning the big 12 championship with two losses. So if you tell me that they're going to win the league, I think they're probably doing that with one or fewer losses. I mean, I I see it's a possibility because we've seen this team in recent years, uh, the last two big 12 titles under Lincoln Riley, they had two losses in each season. So I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility for Oklahoma to win the big 12 with two losses. And, And I think that, I think that's, kind of a reasonable guess almost um, as far as the projected outcomes. It wouldn't surprise me to see them lose two and still win the big 12. Um, but I do see again, as far as the range of outcomes goes, this team could be seven and six, seven and five in the regular season, or the, I think we've talked about it. They could be an 11 and one team if things fall into place, but given all the turnover, given the, the amount of losses they had on the offensive side of the ball, 
the inexperience that you're dealing with on defense, still the, the question marks that you have at defensive tackle. I, I can see why some of our everyday listeners here on Locked On Sooners are a little bit hesitant to project Oklahoma better than nine wins. Um, you know, a lot are kind of falling into that eight or nine win range. And I, I think that that's a reasonable expectation to see this team go from six to eight to nine wins. Obviously we want more. The expectations are higher at the university of Oklahoma, but given what we saw last year, given what's going on, the building, the slow, the slow burn of the rebuilding process. I talked about it several times this week on the show. Again, only two starters remain from that 2021 team. That's how much turnover that they've experienced over the last two off seasons. So to get to nine wins, man, I, I think that's a solid season. Is it great? No, but it's, it's better than what you had. It's showing growth. It's showing progress as you go into the sec and being in contention for the big 12 title at the end of the season. I mean, that's really all you can ask for. If you want to get greedy, sure you can, but given what we've seen from this team in 2022, yeah. Sign me up for a nine win season and playing for the big 12 title. I'd be curious to know what the percentages across the board look like for college football anymore for number of three year starters. And, and I'm with you. They've processed the roster. There's only going to be and And I told you the other day, I don't know that it's this foregone conclusion that Andrew Raymond, Woody Washington are or stay and remain starters for this team. So it's, you know, look, they, they've got a good chance to be those guys, but they've also not got those things totally locked up, in my opinion, either. And it's not unfeasible if things go poorly for either that there's a quick hook there. So you could be looking at a situation, John, where eventually you've got one or zero returning starters from uh, where this thing started out a couple of years ago. But that being said, it's college football and, you know, guys don't stick around forever. And the idea that you've got someone that's a three year starter in general, I would imagine, is not a high percentage across the board in college football. So I'd just be curious what that two years down the road number looks like uh, for starters in general. But just the percentage of the roster itself has really turned over for Oklahoma. So the, the general overarching point, I'm with you. I, I mean, it's a different Oklahoma now. The roster is, it's Brent Vittables roster right i mean so we're gonna see is that too soon with it being brent vittable's roster to get the types of results that folks are expecting or wanting or hoping for this season is that one year away is that two years away i mean those are the million dollar questions this season for oklahoma it, it's to me again it's a process it's i look at this team and i think 2023 could be a better year but i'm not going to sit there and expect them to go out and go 11 and one. If they do, and I'm, I'm shocked. I'm, I'd, I'd love to be surprised by that, but, and I, and I think it's possible. I think it's doable, but I also think that the other end of the spectrum, you know, the floor is just as reasonable and, and a much more likely outcome, the eight and five, nine and four, eight and four, nine and three season, I think is much more likely. Um, a couple other a, a couple other notes, Josh. TCU projected with the third highest or has the third highest ESPN FBI football power index. Texas Tech number four, and then you're looking at the highest ranked. Oh, then you got Baylor five, and then you're looking at UCF at number six, getting a little love from the ESPN football power index. Uh, their national rank is 26 uh, with a win loss projection of seven and four, seven and point seven and four point four. Um, so yeah, the, the football power index is loving them some UCF. And then here again, we're going to probably disagree with this and that's Kansas state at number seven. Uh, I mean, did, did they not watch? I mean, obviously the computers didn't watch Will Howard play. If they did, then we're all in trouble because the computers have become self-aware, but yes, Deuce Vaughn is a huge loss, but they've kept a decent amount of that team together and you got your quarterback back to me. That, that's significant. I'd probably flip TCU and them uh, in these projections if I was just going to, you know, rank them based on what ESPN did. I'd probably flip TCU and, and Kansas State. You know, put Kansas State probably third or fourth uh, in this if if I was going to power rank the teams in the off season. Well, and I think uh, if I'm power ranking head coaches, I've got Coach Kleiman ahead of both uh, what you've got down at UCF 
and uh, McGuire at Texas Tech, though I like what I've seen, you know, from McGuire at Texas Tech. I'm encouraged about what the future could look like there, but give me Coach Kleiman right now, and I'll, I'll hold on and wait one more year on Coach Sonny Dykes at TCU. Very, very impressed. Magical first season. But uh, back it up in year two, and all of a sudden you got you got something uh, talking. So, no, I like Kansas State a lot. I've I've been pretty clear about that. That to me, two of the three in the Big Twelve championship game are going to be Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas State. And I feel best about Kansas State getting to the Big Twelve championship game. Though uh, this just from a predictive standpoint, John tells us that all of the folks that are down and out on Baylor, okay, time to wise up on Dave Aranda's bunch. And, you know, there's been some excitement, again, for, for Coach McGuire and for Texas Tech. And the predictive model here, again, the, the ESPN FBI thing always cracks me up a little bit because it's, well, hang on, we're not ranking teams. And yet, you know, here right now, it's, it's a ranking of teams in the offseason of, well, if everything goes according to the predictive model's plan, here's how we would rank the team. So the predictive model, it's not a ranking, but here's how it ranks the teams. Yeah, and and I'm probably a little bit lower on Baylor than you know than the prediction would be as well. Yeah, I, I just I don't know what this team is. You know, are they the two win team from Aranda's first year? Are they the Big Twelve champion from his second year? Are they the middle of the pack team like they were last year? I think probably what they were in 2022 is kind of the most likely scenario. Um, but I could definitely see them taking a step forward. You know, Blake Shapen. You know now has more years of experience, more games under his belt. He's going to be a little bit better quarterback probably in 2023. So just, you know, fascinating stuff to look through. I, again, I think we both probably feel like Oklahoma's four is eight wins, nine wins, and could potentially be better just depending on how things fall, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Speaking of Oklahoma's chances to win or to make the college football playoff based on the football power index, which sit at 10.7%, our man over at USA Today Sports, Paul Meyerberg, included the Oklahoma Sooners as one of five teams that could make a TCU-like run in 2023 after having a losing season in 2022. Um, so very, very fascinating. You know that there's still a little bit of love for Oklahoma, even after the six and seven season, after all the turnover that they've experienced. While you might see one site saying Brent Venables is under a lot of pressure. In 2023, you got others that still believe that the Sooners are on the right track uh, for this season. Even if you don't believe or are not convinced that Oklahoma is on the right track, I think you can talk yourself into the idea that, okay, well, here's a, you know, speaking of somebody has a ton of experience like Shapin at Baylor and you took your lumps a little bit, Dylan Gabriel, if that was taking his lumps, that was pretty good for taking your lumps at the University of Oklahoma. And, oh, by the way, you know, nice track record before that, obviously, at UCF. So the quarterback that you have in Dylan Gabriel, if things go wrong there, you've got a five-star quarterback in Jackson Arnold who it's not totally – it's unlikely, but it's not totally out of the realm of possibility, John. We've seen this before and more so lately in recent years, not just at Oklahoma with the Caleb Williams, but across the board nationally where – Freshman five-star quarterbacks are more ready to go than ever before to step right in and be stars. We see it. Not saying it's likely. I definitely wouldn't predict it. I'm sticking in the camp that part of the reason that they like Oklahoma is because of Dylan Gabriel. So you start there with the quarterback position. You like it at Oklahoma. Skill position, man, look, we got some questions there, but you're probably uh, bringing a Texas transfer in. That's going to be interesting. Alongside an Andrew Anthony, you already signed a couple of really talented wide receivers in last year's class that are just waiting to take that. So all of which is to say running back's good. Wide receiver, yeah, we've got questions, but probably by the time it's all said and done, John will say, okay, is there a Marvin Mims? Is there a CeeDee Lamb? Is there, you know, on and on and on, these historic wide receivers we've seen Remains to be seen, but collectively, I think Oklahoma is going to be feeling pretty good about skill positions. Offensive line, you got a big recruiting win in Walter Rouse out of the transfer portal. So there's a lot to like offensively. And then, okay, there's too many questions for me to rattle off right here in this limited amount of time we have left defensively for Oklahoma. But I, even just a surface level, I can probably talk you into if you're saying, hey, who could be a surprise candidate to crash the party of the CFP, John? I could probably talk you into. 
hey, this Brent Venables guy, I don't know if you know, but once upon a time at the University of Clemson, and oh, by the way, before that at Oklahoma, he uh, coached teams defensively into national championship games and to where they won national championship games. So again, I know that that's a tired topic for some out there just because of how bad OU was last season defensively, John. That's fresh on the mind, but there is that track record that, look, if I'm trying to find a surprise college football playoff candidate, yeah, I'm probably looking Oklahoma's direction. Because they're going to have the offense. The offense is going to be good. The running game is going to be really, really good. And the it'll be good enough for the passing game to get going as they figure out who are going to be their kind of priority or, or main targets in the passing game. You still got Jalil Farouk, who I love. Drake Stoops, who's just a big play machine. And a lot of talented players that you can kind of use and mix and match a little bit. We'll see who kind of rises to the top of the wide receiver depth chart. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing this first depth chart for the spring game because it might give us some answers as to what this is going to look like in the fall. They're not all going to be the same answers, but we saw this crew last year put a lot of stock in having the guys that were around for the spring at the top of the depth chart. You know, it took, it was very difficult for guys that showed up in the summer to break through. You saw Gavin Freeman get, get opportunities a little bit. But a guy like Gavin Sawchuk, he didn't arrive until summertime. He didn't get very many opportunities until the Cheez-It Bowl. So how this all plays out for you know the, the summertime guys versus the spring guys, I think who we see at the top of the depth chart for the spring is going to be very indicative of who's going to be at the top of the depth chart come fall unless somebody that was here in the spring like a Macari Vickers usurps uh, a Gentry Williams or a Kendall Dolby or something like that at the cornerback position because – I mean, they got a lot of really talented true freshmen that came in, you know, during the the early signing period or um, as early enrollees, pardon me. So there's going to be a lot of talent and a lot of competition, but uh, I, I'm really looking forward to this first depth chart preview kind of that we get for the spring game. Again, it, it might just, it, who knows how much, how many answers it'll give us, but we'll be able to talk about that um, and kind of our spring game takeaways, uh, next week coming up this week, we're going to have a special episode with John Garcia. Uh, I'll interview, I'll talk to him on Friday. Um, and we'll have that episode for you up on Friday. So we can get ahead of some of the recruiting stuff that's going to happen this weekend. Uh, we'll talk as much, um, uh, in detail if we have any commitments before then. Um, but we'll, we'll definitely flesh out some things that could happen. We'll talk, you know, the five-star priority guys, the David stones, Bryant West goes the Williams, Duenaries. We'll keep talking about uh, guys that they might be under the radar, uh, flying on under the most people's radar, but definitely on Oklahoma's radar. We'll see what John has to say about all that. But that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thanks so much for tuning in and being part of the show. And shout out again to our Everyday Club. Appreciate you being a part of this show every single day. Follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on Ref. Hear him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on 94.7 The Ref in Norman. Follow me on Twitter at John9Williams, and you can read my work covering the Sooners over at Soonerswire.com. Follow the show at Locked On Sooners. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Again, we're free and available on every podcast platform and on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop. But until next time, he's Josh Elmer. I'm John Williams. Boomer Sooner.